Are you enjoying the morning so far? Yes. yes, it's super, super uplifting. Every year, I'm so excited to see what everyone presents. So my name is Kendra Lester, and I am a member here at South Seminole Church of Christ. Following with today's theme, I'll be speaking on seasoning your actions with salt. Before I dive into my lesson, I want to paint a picture to help illustrate the topic. So imagine you are baking a cake from scratch for a potluck at church tomorrow. I'm imagining a red velvet cake. That is my absolute favorite, finished with some cream cheese frosting. Some people in the back, they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so at the same time, there's a load of clothes that's in the washer. You're listening out for the buzzer to go off so it goes in the dryer. You're watching your little one. There's probably some TV going on in the background. So there's a lot of things happening. And you're doing basically what we do best, multitasking, as the queen of the castle. So you scoop the last bit of batter into the baking pan and put it into the oven, imagining how delicious that red velvet cake or my mother-in-law's pound cake or strawberry cake or whatever cake that you like, how delicious that will be. And then now you're putting the clothes in the dryer and then you remember you forgot to put the salt in the cake. No big deal, right? Cake is supposed to be sweet. No one will notice absolutely wrong. As you've heard so far, even a little bit of salt can have a big impact. Let's see how salt impacts the cake baking process. The main function of salt in cake recipes is to enhance the flavor of the other ingredients. Its presence perks up the depth and complexity of other flavors as the ingredients meld together. Salt also provides a balance to the sweetness of the cake batter but a salty flavor should not be discernible. You can reduce the salt according to your taste, but if you leave it out, you'll likely find that your cake tastes a little flat. For the rest of my time, I'd like to share how salt in cakes serve the same function as salt in our actions, by enhancing and perking up those around us, balancing the good and evil in the world, and making us discernible among men. <coughs> Okay, by a show of hands, how many of you know mean, grumpy people? They can be an old boss, a coworker, a distant cousin, you know. Okay, now, keep your hand raised if you know mean, grumpy Christians. I am hoping not to see any hands, but I see some hands. Okay. I remember an old coworker of mine who was the human form of a grumpy cat. I would say good morning to him and he'd like mumble, what's so good about the morning? I had to get out of bed, I have to come to work, I don't really wanna be here. And then I'd go back like you're alive, you have a job that pays your bills. And he'd mumble back, well it doesn't pay all my bills, I'd rather be fishing. And we'd go back and forth until I run out of positive rebuttals. Needless to say, after all of those interactions, I was exhausted. And that's not the type of characteristic we want to have for Christians. When you think of Christians, you should envision wonderful things as mentioned in Philippians 4, verses 8 through 9. Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, think about these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, do these things, and the God of peace will be with you. We have lost our flavor as Christians if we are viewed as those mean and grumpy people. The world may call us many things, and you can probably list off so many things the world has called you as a Christian, but mean, grumpy, bitter, and all those negative things should not be one of them. Instead, we should brighten a room when we walk into it, reminding people of the goodness that God has created in us. Christians should be a joy to be around and should not suck the joy out of a room. The joy and inner peace that we have is one way to let our light shine in the world. We are all faced or have faced or will face or currently facing challenges in our lives. But when we walk with our heads held high, 
a smile on our face, and a joyful song in our heart, we show the world that God lives within us, and our faith is stronger than our tribulations. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14, further defines the positive qualities Christians should possess. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you must also do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Nowhere in the Bible are we commanded to be mean or grumpy people. We are instructed to show mercy and kindness, forgive others, and so many noble things. When we do these commandments, we enhance the world around us. Can you imagine a world void of any good, like my red velvet cake with no salt? Times may seem dreary now, but what if there were absolutely no Christians in the world? I shudder at the thought. John 3 verses 19 through 21 comes to mind. And this is a condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Christians are commanded to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, shunning evil wherever we go. Despite many people's desire for darkness, shining our light always allows others to see Christ illuminating through our actions. We all know the story of Lot and his wife. She is literally an example of salt in our lives, but the bad kind, disobedience. In the story, Sodom and Gomorrah were filled with so much evil, God sent angels to destroy them. Lot and obedient members of his family were spared. As they fled, they were given specific instructions like we have in the Bible. Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Genesis chapter 19, verse 17. Simple, right? Get out of there. Don't look back. Well, we know how the story ends. She looked back. Lot's wife was disobedient and was immediately punished. As Christians, we can't fight evil if we are giving into it like Lot's wife. Salt in our actions is one of the main ingredients that will preserve our holiness and make us more like Christ. Just as was mentioned in the Bible reading, we should be in the world, but not part of the evil in it. If we did exactly the same things as those in the world, the balance between good and evil would be completely thrown off. And this brings us to my last topic. When Christians are present, it should be evident that we are salty. We belong to Christ. In the world full of all the evils listed in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, our actions should instead reflect the good that exists through Christ. It takes little effort to give in to fleshly and human desires, especially when times get tough. In those moments, we should ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? We must constantly remind ourselves that we are of Christ. We will never be perfect like him, but if we strive to follow in his footsteps, we will demonstrate Christ-like behavior. When I worked in an office, I had a printout of the fruits of the spirit right above my laptop, reminding me of the characteristics I had to demonstrate on a daily basis. When I tell you I looked at that list multiple times during the day to remind me what I should be doing, joy, peace, long suffering, joy, peace, long suffering. It was a good mental note. But that's the, those are the qualities that we should exhibit as Christians. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, loving those that hate us or mock us, having peace in the middle of a storm, patiently enduring those difficult situations are not common behaviors of many people. So when we do those things, people notice. 
Our actions in those moments can provide opportunities for us to share the word of God with others. People are usually curious and ask, why are you doing it that way? Or how come you're not mad? Or are you crazy? Like, you should be upset by now. I am also reminded of 1 Peter 2, verses 11 and 12. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. We are warned to stay away from the evil and instructed to demonstrate honorable actions among men. Our actions should speak for themselves. I am a follower of Christ. When anyone sees us, they should be able to see Christ as we are a reflection of him. Several years back, I was unexpectedly hospitalized. It was an incredibly scary time for my family. Yet I remember several doctors and nurses asking me why I was so calm through it all. I'm glad I appeared calm to them because on the inside I was like, what am I going to do? What's going to happen next? Who's going to do the laundry? A long list of things, but it remained calm. And people noticed. The only explanation was my faith in God. I had no control over the situations and left things in God's hand. Several family members, brothers and sisters in Christ from this congregation, and friends from all over came to visit me. They took the time out of their busy schedules and they sat with me. They prayed with me. They laughed with me. We cried together. And at the same time, people were watching. As the saying goes, actions speak louder than words. Our faithfulness and genuine love for one another in that particular situation spoke volumes to all those around me. They saw Christ in our lives and they wanted to know more. Before I take my seat, I want to leave with you this passage, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. It says it right there. We are God's special people, peculiar people even. That comes with certain responsibilities as well as incredible reward if we remain faithful until death. Just like salt and cakes, we need salt in our actions to enhance and perk up those around us, balance the good and evil in the world, and make us discernible among men. If we leave salt out of our lives, just like my red velvet cake, we become flat. Thank you for your time today, ladies, and may you enjoy the rest of this event.